Hi there, my name is Josh. I am the pastor of Connection and Formation at the Heart, and I want to welcome you to another study session. We are going through our distinct values at the Heart, but like I mentioned before, these values certainly are concepts that any follower of Christ would want to look into a little bit deeper uh, to find out kind of the, the true sense of what each of them might hold for each one of us and how we can live those values out in a real and meaningful way. And so over the course of the last couple weeks, we've gone through simple, we've gone through loving, and today we're going to go through our value of true. And what does it really mean to be true and uh, how might we live that out as well? I want to remind you that these study sessions are just kind of an ongoing attempt for us to try to start the conversation among groups or even with an individual, kind of with yourself. Uh, I hope that these sessions are giving you the opportunity to ask questions, to um, maybe explore things that you had always thought of exploring or maybe uh, even presenting some new ideas that you had never thought of before. It's certainly a work in progress, and I hope that, uh, that they are meaningful and that they're worthwhile to you. And I thank you for taking the time to watch them. And again, a reminder that these study sessions go live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, that's when they premiere, and then they're available on our YouTube channel from that point on that you can refer back to them, you can watch them, Time and again, you can catch up with any that you may have missed. So I invite you to do that. Also too, if you haven't already, if you would subscribe to our channel, then you can be notified when new, um, new videos go live um, and you can be on top of that. So on our website, we have written this. True is being known for what we're for rather than what we're against. And it removes barriers. In truth, we can lead radically sanctified lives, be the unique creations God has called each of us to be, and experience truly intimate relationships with one another. So again, I've mentioned this before. I mentioned it on Sunday when I gave a kind of a longer message on what it meant to be true. But if we don't have a good sense of what true is what truth is for us if we don't have that kind of anchored within us then everything kind of feels relative it feels like we're standing on shifting sand um, everything seems to be kind of in flux and so it can be really hard when things are coming at us so fast and uh, we have really big experiences in our lives that kind of shake us to the core uh, if we don't have that bedrock, if we don't have that strong foundation, um, those deep roots, um, it can feel like we're being pushed and moved in so many different directions. So this evening, I wanted to focus our attention on um, the Gospel of John, and in particular, Chapter 8. And this is uh, where we learn of um, Jesus' heart when it comes to truth. And there's a great uh, exchange between Jesus and uh, the relig religious leaders of the time that I think gives um, a wonderful illustration of who Jesus truly is. So we open up in chapter 8 of John and we're introduced to this moment where the religious leaders bring in a woman who has been um, been said to be adulterous. She is accused of adultery, and so she's being brought in to be judged and ultimately to be stoned, which was the punishment at that time. And so again, the, the uh, religious leaders brought her in before this, this panel of, I'm sure, all men, and uh, I'm sure just a really intimidating moment. But Jesus is somewhat subdued, a bit quiet. He's found to be just drawing in the sand and he says something to the effect of, for those of you who have never sinned, may you cast the first stone. This is a, a pretty well-known exchange between Jesus and the religious 
leaders of the time. Again, this kind of ongoing um, tension growing between them. And Jesus is calling out the very heart of these religious leaders at the time. You see, they, they were very much living in fear. And anyone who broke the law in their minds were considered a threat. And yet Jesus shows such an incredible sense of grace and mercy at this moment. And it, what's interesting about this passage as well is that as soon as Jesus says those words, it's, it's said that the crowd dispersed. <laughs> there was no exchange. There was no argument. I think everyone kind of realized at that moment uh, that they, they were kind of called out uh, for what they were doing. And so for us, I think that we need to recognize that we need to, in our own lives, start to redefine what we believe to be truth. Because so often I think that we have had truth defined for us by other people who may have had an agenda or may have had a ulterior motive, an ulterior motive to kind of keep us in line, even to control us. But what do we know to be true? What do we know to be true about God? And ultimately, what do we know to be true about Jesus? So here are some things just to consider for yourself. For us to be truly free, I think we need to understand how God sees us. And have you really thought about that again? Have you had other people tell you that? Or is this something that you've taken the opportunity to discover for yourself? You see, I, be I believe that God sees us as cherished, that he cherishes us. I believe that we are valued. I believe that we are ultimately forgiven for any wrongdoings, both in the past and certainly in the present and definitely into the future we are forgiven and we are loved above all we are loved and we only have to look at the life death and resurrection of Christ to recognize God's great love for us that he would come all the way from heaven to earth to show us the way to show us the truth that is Jesus so again understanding this deep truth of who God is and how he sees us I think it hits our very soul it hits our very soul and we come to better understand truth as what it actually means in God's eyes and who we are in God's eyes. In John 8, we're told that Jesus says to the ones who believed him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does Jesus mean by this? Ultimately, I think that in that first part, when he says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. He's again referring back to the moment when he says that there are two commandments that are most important. One is to love God with all of ourselves, and the other is to love people in the same way. Love God, love people. We hear that time and time again. I think there's a little bit of a thread there that we can start to pull on and recognize the depth of what that truly means for us. And then he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Have you ever considered what that might mean? Beyond just the ideas of uh, what are a part of this world, the anxiety that m we might face, the stress that we might face, maybe even the debts that we're in, all of the things of this world we can easily become kind of fixated on those things. But more importantly, and I think more foundationally and more deeply, Christ is talking about the very spiritual nature, the spiritual freedom that we experience when we come to understand who we truly are in God's eyes. So for us, I think there are two ways that we can easily live this out. I shouldn't say easily. I keep doing that. There are two simple ways that I think that we can live this out. And the first way is to follow Jesus's lead. 
So referring back to that exchange with those religious leaders, how can we demonstrate the same kind of grace and mercy, the loving kindness that Jesus showed that woman that day? I think an even, even deeper question and one that certainly requires a bit of self-evaluation and self-awareness is, do you protect yourself from people? Are you like the religious leaders in that you live a life of fear and in living a life of fear, you then keep people at arm's length. You're not willing to or able to, or you're not even aware of how you keep people at bay. Instead of allowing the grace of God to flow freely and unimpeded through us, we so often will put up barriers, put up walls as a way to protect ourselves because of the fear that we're living in. We are living in bondage to fear itself as opposed to true freedom that we find in Christ. And the true freedom that comes from that is being more of ourselves, being more of who God created us to be, being able to allow for his love to flow freely in and through us to the very people, to the very world that so desperately needs it. So that's the first thing. Follow Jesus' lead. Ask yourself the question, am I protecting myself from people or am I allowing the grace of God to flow through me easily and simply? I think the second way that we can live this out in a very meaningful and real way is to seek God. And again, that may sound trite, that may sound obvious, but have you really considered how you might do that? What kind of disciplines can you introduce into your own life where you can truly seek God, truly seek the face of who created you, seek the heart of who loves you? What are the ways that you can do that? I think we need to rest in the truth of who we are in and through Christ. And by resting in that truth, we again can be more of who God created us, created us to be. And we can be more of what the world needs us to be. We are forgiven. You and I are forgiven. We are forgiven people in and through Christ. Do you believe that? Do you accept that? Do you embrace that each and every day? Not only that, but then do you allow yourself the grace to forgive yourself for the mistakes that you have made in your own life? And you know what they are. You know what they are. But are you continually beating yourself up? Are you continually stoning yourself? Are you continually punishing yourself for those mistakes? Or are you going to God and you're saying, I know that I am forgiven and I give these things to you. Please take them from me. Take them off of me. Allow me the freedom to live in your love. So I think a big part of identifying and seeking God is to identify and seek our own identity, which has been given to us all through scripture. But have you allowed other people to define that for you? Or are you willing to make the effort and to try to discover it for yourself? What it means for yourself as opposed to allowing others to define it for you. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are three, three identifiers in particular that I want to call out to you today. And I'll, I'll write the scriptures here. And they're just simple references, but I would encourage you to read it in context. I would encourage you to read it in its fullness, uh, read the entire chapter, read the entire book if you need to, read commentary, uh, Google things, study, learn, be active in understanding and owning your, um, your identity and understanding what these scriptures actually say about you. So the first one is this. We are made in the image of God. Have you heard that before? 
And if so, have you ever wondered what that meant? Have you taken the time to really discover what that means? And the reference I want to give you is Genesis 1.27. Genesis 1.27. This goes back to the story of creation. And I think what's really important for us to remember is that so often I think that we are told that our story begins in Genesis 3 which is when, when sin enters the world. But in fact, our story starts at the very beginning, well before that time. And that's how God sees us, and that is why God pursues us. He wants to reconcile and redeem that broken relationship that we have with him. That's why Christ is even a part of this story. It shows Christ. God's love for us, again, that he came all the way to earth to make that happen, that he would send his one and only son to not only live in the way that we should live, to show us the way, but also then to hang on the cross, to be buried in the grave, and ultimately to be risen from the dead, so that you and I can live in the eternal hope of Christ himself. I think too often we're limited or we're fixated on salvation alone. And there is so much more to the relationship with God himself. So discover that. Discover what it means to be made in the image of God. When you come to understand why you are made in the image of God, then you can better understand how others are made in the image of God as well. We are also children of God. And this is found in Galatians um, 3.26. We are children of God. What does that mean? What does the fullness of that mean for you? What does the fullness of that mean when you look at others as well? Again, it's to recognize that God's love is for everyone. God's grace is for everyone. God wants to redeem the entire world. He is a universal God who wants all of us to be back in relationship with him. So what does that mean for us? I just want to read. Um, let me read Genesis 1 and then I'll read Galatians 3. So Genesis 1, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Again, that's the image of God. And then as children of God in Galatians 3, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And then the last one that I want to share with you, certainly not the only one. Um, there are many more that you can discover, but let's start with these three. So the last one. <laughs> This marker is giving me trouble here. I'll try a better one. Romans 8, 16 through 18. Romans 8, 16 through 18. We are co-heirs in Christ. And I'll read that for us. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Isn't that great news right there? So we are heirs in God, co-heirs in Christ. What does that mean? That's kind of an interesting concept as well. So let's discover those things together and let's truly start to start to recognize and start to define our identity, not based again on what other people have said, but based on what God says about us and what God says about himself. Let's dive deep into God's word and discover those things. And I think you and I will truly then be able to live sanctified lives that allow us to um, enjoy relationships that are deep and meaningful, not only with others, but with God himself. So that's it. 
That is all I wanted to share with you today about our value of true. And I hope that it has given you some ideas or some directions moving forward on how you might be able to define true for yourself and also how you might be able to live this out on a regular basis in a very true, in a very meaningful, in a very significant way. Again, if you want to subscribe to our channel to get notifications when the next study session is going to be coming um, coming live and that will be next Tuesday and I'll be talking about our value of called and what that actually means and how we might be able to live that out as well and I hope that this again kind of invites you and inspires you into conversations um, maybe with yourself but certainly with a group of people and if you want to join a digital spiritual formation group at the heart I invite you to email me. You can also visit our website to find out more information about how you might be able to do that. And we're certainly looking for hosts who would be willing to be kind of that point person who would be able to gather people together and then be able to facilitate these conversations with one another. So again, I pray that by knowing the truth that you will be set free not just in a worldly sense, much, much more than that. In a spiritual sense, you would understand your true identity in Christ, how God sees you, and ultimately how you may be able to reflect that understanding and that love and grace and mercy into the world itself. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may he grant you peace. Amen.